because I have the life I've chosen, I can connect with people very freely. Like I really wanted this, this combination of freedom and connection. I wanted both in my life and I've somehow managed to create that. You know, if I find a connection with someone, I have the freedom to explore it wherever it's going to go, whether it's one night or a lifetime. And to me, that's, that's been just a very deep value that I have that I didn't get to have. And then I have fought very hard to have. Welcome to Normalizing Non-Monogamy, the podcast where we interview incredible people from all over the world to hear their personal journeys of self-discovery through the lenses of love, sex, and relationships. Our mission is to show people that they're not alone and to inspire them to embrace their true selves so that together we can open minds and live authentically without shame. We believe everyone's story is powerful and beautiful, yet it's important to remember that everyone does life a little bit differently and that the views and opinions expressed by our guests do not necessarily reflect our own. Additionally, we aren't doctors. Please consult a medical professional for anything regarding your health that you might learn about on the show. Enjoy! Well, welcome to episode 349. We're Finn and Emma, and today we have a fantastic conversation with Sandy. Sandy's amazing, as you'll see. She is a psychologist and a sex therapist and currently practices solo polyamory. She's had a journey working through a lot of shame in her life and a roller coaster of lots of different experiences that she walks us through to get to where she is today of fully embracing herself. Or at least as fully as possible. Yes. <laughs> Much more fully than she was years ago. Yeah, for sure. Because as you'll hear today in, in Sandy's story, the, there's so many times where she tried to be herself, tried to let a little bit of herself slip out or a big part of herself. And and shame sort of shoved her back in and told her to be quiet. And today, yeah, we're excited to have her here shouting her story from the mountaintops on our podcast. So a ton of gratitude, Sandy. Thank you for coming on and sharing your story today. A quick reminder that links to all of Sandy's work are in your podcast show notes. They're available in your podcast player or on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com on the podcast tab. Where you also find podcast show notes for all of our previous guests, most of which who have amazing photos, just like Sandy, Mm -hmm. and we'd love to have you check that out. For anyone who's a premium subscriber, we're, we're going to jump into the interview with Sandy right now. And for anyone else, we're going to go through a few announcements. First up, if you're not familiar with the premium subscription, it's a way to skip these announcements up front, jump right into the interview, but don't worry, you still get important dates in the outro. To sign up for the premium subscription, go to our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com, scroll down on the homepage, and you can sign up right there. One of those dates is actually today, July 17th, 2024. It is currently right in the middle of the week of visibility for non-monogamy, which is amazing. And Emma and I are hosting a free virtual workshop tonight. That's, again, Wednesday, July 17th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Pacific or, let's say, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern and and everything in between. Uh, Yes, this is a virtual workshop we're calling Is There a Right Way to Do Non-Monogamy, where we dispel tons of different myths about how to be non-monogamous. And we'd love, love, love to have you join us. It is a free workshop. You can sign up at our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the banner at the top of the page. And if you're listening to this in the future and you're like, darn it, I missed the July 17th workshop, don't worry. Go over to our website and check out some of our current events going on. I know that we will have multiple different things happening in the future. Yes. And one other quick thing about that uh, banner on our website that has the links to get tickets for tonight's workshop, that will redirect you to a website slash app called Plura. And Plura is an amazing uh, app for finding community and events around sort of sex positive not not just non-monogamy, like sex positive in the broader sense, and just amazing, amazing people and events all over the country. So you will start to see some of our events showing up on there more in the future. So download the app. It's free. The workshop is free, and we'd love to have you join us. Next up, a reminder that we have an upcoming community retreat. It's an in-person community retreat, September 13th to the 15th, 2024, in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is an in-person retreat for our online community. If you're interested in joining, we would love to have you. You can go over to our our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the community tab. There you can find out information about joining our virtual community for only five bucks a month and all of the information about the 
in-person retreat coming up in September as well. Yeah, there's a document there that lists out the entire weekend of events and activities and everything going on. We're expecting probably 50 to 60 people to be coming to the Bay Area, and we're super excited about that. And I would just say now is a great time to join the community if you are thinking about this retreat or maybe a future one, because the whole benefit is you get to know people virtually for a couple of months, and then you get to spend time with them in real life. You get to land and hang out with your friends that you've just been meeting. So it's a great, great sort of combination. Woohoo! Woohoo! <laughs> Yay for combinations. And finally, a quick reminder to check out our favorite way to get tested for STIs. It is stdcheck.com. You can go over to the resources tab on our website and there you can find links to stdcheck.com. Using those links gives you $10 off, making a 10 panel test only $129. Plus you support the show. So thank you so much in advance for using those links and you get to know your sexual health status. So again, Again, go and check out stdcheck.com. And with that, we're going to jump right into the interview. One final quick reminder, please, we'd love to hear from you. We love your feedback, and we love to have people like you come on the podcast. This show is for everyone, not just sex therapists and, and psychologists or educators. It is for everyone to share their story to help everybody feel less alone. So please send us an email, send us a voicemail. We would love to hear from you. We'd love to talk to you. We'd love to answer your questions, all of the things. Yes, please reach out to us. And with that, we are ready to go and talk with Sandy. Welcome, Sandy. We're so excited to have you here today. It's been a little while coming, and we thank you for your patience with us. Yes. And we're just excited to dive in. So thank you so much for being here. You're so welcome. I'm so excited to talk with you two finally in depth. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we get to, we get to hang out at like local events all the time, and we I know. we give hugs and we say hello, and then we wander off into the crowd. But now we get to pick your brain and hear your whole story. So, yeah, yeah. super stoked. Me too. We'd love for you just to start by introducing yourself at whatever level you feel comfortable doing so. Sure. So my name is Dr. Sandy Peace, and I'm a psychologist and sex therapist here in California. And I work with queer folks and poly folks and kinky folks, as well as just run-of-the-mill folks. Um, so, uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know what else to say right now. Please edit all of that out. I'll edit all of that out? <laughs> well, let's... <laughs> Nope, that was perfect. We're going to keep it. All the ramblings. <laughs> excellent. And you're here, obviously, you just said you work with folks from all over the, the queer poly scene. And we happen to know secretly that you also explore a little bit of that space yourself. And we'd love to dig into that today. Yeah. And maybe just starting with maybe from the beginning, at what point did sort of I will call alternative relating or relationships that weren't the mononormative come into your worldview. Sure. Well, if we go way back, I mean, it goes back to kindergarten yeah. where I had a crush on two little boys in the kindergarten who were cousins, <laughs> you know, but okay. If we go up a little more into my, my teen years when I was, I, I discovered kissing at age 12. Okay. And then I so saw I had a little boyfriend. Did, by the way. What's that? Long before I did, by the way. <laughs> yeah. So I had my little boyfriend in the sixth grade and we just kissed whenever we could like find a spare moment. And he broke up with me and just broke my heart. But I'm a very kinesthetic, huggy person. Like I get to know people but through physical connection. I was an athlete, I played sports. And so I I just wanted to kiss everyone who would kiss me back. And so that was kind of, I went to a small school, so I, I kissed a lot of people. I mean, if we did percentages of the class, it's probably a lot. At that point, I was just kissing boys because I didn't realize you could kiss girls and not be, you know, totally persecuted. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't realize is if you do that, then people start to call you names. And not the good kind of names. Not yeah. the good kind of names, no. Um, and so I learned very quickly through my small, I grew up in a small town in northern Minnesota that was quite Catholic, Catholic and Lutheran, and I was not either of those. I was Christian, but like Methodist, you know, Presbyterian, and had a very sex positive mom. And so I'm just like, yeah, let's kiss all the people. But if you do that, you get called a slut. 
And um, I learned if they date someone's ex-boyfriend, they might want to beat you up and will corner you in the locker room and threaten that. So I learned both for my social status, you know, rumor mill, to stay out of the rumor mill, to prevent myself from getting beat up, I needed to just pick one person and stick with them. And so I had to kind of temper my polyamorous leanings and and fit that kind of mononormative model for survival, basically. I'm curious at that time, and I know this was not just yesterday, but it sounds like some of the people were interested in clearly interested in kissing. I mean, you had these opportunities. So, yes. so some people were like, yeah, I'll take some more of Sandy. And others were like, no, Sandy's a slut. And I'm curious, like, that's a confusing message to be getting. I mean, from sixth grade on. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, it, it was, it was an interesting, I've always had this interesting conflict between religion and f- sexual freedom. Mm-hmm. And in college, I studied psychology and I studied world religions too. Like, it's always been an interesting question for me of like, how do we reconcile this? And so, because I grew up in a household with a very sex positive, body positive mom, I, and I'm wanting, like, I would buy my friends underwear for Christmas. And some people, my friends were like, wow, this is so great. Let's do an underwear exchange. But, you know, the cool girls were like, oh my God, like, what are you doing? What are you, what is that even? You know? And so, but those are the girls I was playing sports with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So it was a very interesting thing where I didn't really fit in with any group, but I also running in different circles. Yes. But then I fit in with every group. Yeah. And, And what I didn't realize at the time was that I'm also queer. You know, that was the revelation that came after taking my first feminist philosophy class freshman year of college in probably 1994 or 95. And I'm like, oh, wait, lesbians? That's a thing? Wait, that might be a thing that I am also. Wait, bisexuality? What? Right? But even that, there's an interesting dilemma because we're trying to reconcile what you like men and you like women. and my heart broke one day when my favorite cool aunt, we were talking, she was talking about one of her friends who she thought was a lesbian. And then she started just, you know, pontificating of like, yeah, I get gay men and I get lesbians, but bisexual people, they need to just pick a side. They're just confused. And I'm like, oh, (sighs) yeah. And so like my little self shut down because she was the person in my family who I thought, you're going to get me. Like, mm-hmm. like you're going to accept me. Like I came out to my mom and she, you know, she was always like pro gay rights and pro choice, but kind of like, but my kid doing that, that'd be weird. And so it's like, she got, she had a conference with my mom and my grandma and my really conservative aunt and my great grandma. And they decided that my bisexuality was just like a phase I was going through in college. Well, it's nice that they decided for you. Yeah, you didn't totally. have to think about it. Yeah, totally. But again, it's one of those moments where it's like, okay, I got it. I guess I just have to shut down that part of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So there's an emerging awareness, but there's all these forces outside of me that I'm needing to shut down just to s- manage my situation, just to survive my situation. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So tough. And I'm curious at, Throughout this process, was there any, I mean, because clearly it it seemed to feel right. Like it seemed to be your natural tendencies. Were you at any point like trying to like sneak it? And like, like I'm still going to make out with these boys. Like I'll just find a way to do it where they're not going to catch me or I'm going to still be bisexual. I don't care what my mom and grandma and great grandma all think about it. You know, in high school, not so much because you know, again, that paradox of like, I want to be loving and free and all of that. And I am jealous as hell 
mm-hmm. and possessive yeah. as hell, especially back then. So insecure, just so like did not want my boyfriend to be flirting with someone else. Would get so angry. They'd get so angry, right? So again, it's kind of this very stereotypical way of relating of jealousy and possessiveness and all of that. So that has definitely evolved a lot over time. Um, Mm -hmm. And both, you know, my internal thinking and how I work with those emotions and how I behave in those situations has changed dramatically. Like I don't even recognize myself from now to that, you know, then to now. Yeah. And then in college, did it, did that shift? Yeah. So college, I had a boyfriend in high school, like my senior year of high school, who was a year younger than me. And I had such a crush on his best friend. Like if we would have all been very evolved, we could have had some amazing threesomes, but (laughs) we were not very evolved. And so there was just this weird tension, whatever happening. So I went off to college. Meanwhile, my boyfriend is back home and we're not seeing each other very often because I'm very far away. So I studied abroad in France. I kissed someone while I was in France. How can you not? I'm literally walking across the street. I meet someone in the middle of the street. By the time we get to the other side of the street, we are making out. Like, welcome to Paris (laughs) when you're 19. You still had your bags from the airport, huh? Yeah, pretty much. And then, like, we met up later, me and my, I brought a friend and he took us out dancing all night in Paris. It was great. Um, He was black. So they wouldn't let us into many clubs because it was white Jeez. women with a black man. So that was also Paris in 1995. So fascinating. But while I was gone in Paris, my boyfriend also cheated on me and not just kissing. Yeah. So, so that was also a very interesting and confusing thing because a part of my brain is like, well, yeah, duh. He's like a young man, a senior in college, like we're far apart, like, of course. And then the other part of me was totally betrayed and it's like writing nasty letters to people from, you know, France, like, don't even think about it. Like I scared the shit out of someone. They like, okay, I won't touch him. Got it. (laughs) I love how you had to write a letter though. That's just amazing. (laughs) Yeah. There were no cell phones. There was no social media. In four to seven days, you're going to get it from me. Yeah. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. But you know, let me, let me jump backwards um, to uh, high school again. I dated someone one summer who was three years older than me. Also got a bad, I had not had sex at this point. He had had sex. And so people were like, oh, they definitely must be having sex. No, he was like a perfect gentleman. I tried to get him to do more. He would not do more, whatever. But We also had that situation where we lived far apart. We were both really broke, so we couldn't make long-distance phone calls because it cost too much. So we wrote love letters, love letters, and then just saw I would go to his baseball games, you know? And so I I reread the love letters recently. I went home and, like, cleared out my room at home. Thanks, Marie Kondo, for making me do that. (laughs) But so I'm reading the letter, and I remember... I didn't remember this, but he was like, yeah, I really like you, and I, but I miss you, and then I meet other girls, and I was just talking to my dad about this, and my dad was like, well, yeah, why don't you just have an open relationship? Wow. wow. So here I am at like 14. My 17-year-old boyfriend's dad is like, why don't you just have an open relationship, son? So if I look back, that was probably my first concept of open relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But then let's fast forward to college. I break up with high school boyfriend. It's a big, long, drawn out, dramatic thing. And I start dating someone new, like the coolest guy I had ever met, like way too cool for me. We are dating all of a sudden. I'm like, holy shit, this is amazing. And he's totally okay with me by being bisexual. And he's even like, you know, if you want to explore that side, I don't want to hold you back. We're in college. I'm like, great. So like we figure out how to have a threesome with one of our mutual female friends. Whoa, amazing. We all sat down. We talked about it. Like he and I talked, like, what are the parameters? I don't know what the hell I'm doing. You know, we talked to her. We kind of get together. We 
talk about the parameters. We have an amazing threesome. And then the fire alarm in the building goes off. (laughs) And I'm the RA. So we're Uh, like, it's the middle of winter. We're putting our clothes on. We're running out into the snow. And we're just giggling with our shirts backwards and inside out. I'm like, (laughs) does anyone know? No one knows what we were just doing. (laughs) So I'm like, oh, wow. Okay. Like, well, this was cool. (laughs) That was fun. Yeah. That was fun. Okay. I'm with a guy who kind of, there's some openness here. There's some, there's some curiosity. There's some acceptance. Like, we have some, we, there's some possibility here. Well, and also just, to, I want to want to say like, amazing that at that age, you sat down and talked about it. Like you talked about, maybe it wasn't the perfect pick your poison, fries, stars, whatever, whatever consent talk you want to have. Maybe it wasn't the perfect, but like you did, you did something yeah. that got everybody on the same page and you said it was an amazing threesome. Right. Yeah. Totally fine. But yeah. it was still around that kind of possessiveness and insecurity. Like, sure, I don't sure. want you having penetrative sex with her, but you could totally go down on her. Right. Yeah. Right. Not perfect, but still quite quite yeah. impressive, Sandy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm doing a little curtsy. Yeah. And hot enough you set off the fire alarm. So yeah. that's, I think, what we have to keep in mind. You know, I hadn't ever considered that. <laughs> 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 yes. Love it. So, Love it. so the the story really starts to unfold when this new boyfriend, the cool, the coolest guy I've ever met, boyfriend and I, um, graduate. We move to Minneapolis. We get married wow. right out of college, like a year after college, we get married. And then his job was opening a branch office in San Francisco and Paris and London. And he comes home one night. He's like, so. They're opening offices in Paris and London and San Francisco. Any interest in moving? And we look at each other. We're like, San Francisco! (laughs) So, like, a month later, we were, like, off to San Francisco, found us a nice apartment in the Upper Haight, and the story unfolds. I did not have a job. I just quit my job. I was working at the Minnesota Twin and Family Research Study, like, researching twins. and he had his job. So I got there with no job. So I just walked up and down hate street. And three days later, I had a job back in those days. You just walked into a store, filled out an application and you could get a job. It was December. So people were hiring for the holidays. I am literally still friends with the owner who hired me. So awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah. And so, so I started that job. It was great. And I I transferred to another store to help them get that started. And then there is a new store manager who was this very hot British special forces theater actor, best pool player I've ever met, totally outgoing and fun guy. And he thought I was lesbian. Like back then I had super short hair. I'm like wearing my leather jacket, driving my motorcycle. I'm like lesbian vibes. (laughs) <laughs> right. My, my bitch husband's on the back of my motorcycle. Like, you know, he's got beautiful long dreadlocks. And so like, we're an interesting couple. <laughs> and so he's, you know, he's British, this guy. He's like, so we're going to go to the pub after work. Cause that's what you do. But we were the only two who went. So we started talking and then, you know, you start talking about your relationship and then we start to realize, oh, maybe things are not so great. And All of a sudden, I start falling for this guy. Like, he's the opposite of my husband. My husband's like a computer programmer and very, like, kind of quiet and not super assertive and, you know, very, like, cool. And this guy's like a theater geek and, like, very outgoing and, like, rowdy like me. Like, we were just more alike Mm personality-wise. Yeah, yeah. And so we started talking and I'm, I'm like... I think there's some like, like foursome vibes that could be happening. So I'm like, what? Let's go on a double date. So he was married and you were married married and I was married and we're all in like our early twenties. Sure. Had you and your husband, besides the, the super hot threesome, had you explored any other stuff around there? Was it just like one and done fire alarm scared us off? Let's graduate and get married and, and get to San Francisco. Yes, we did have a brief period of breaking up 
mm-hmm. as you do senior as year. we do as yeah. we did yeah yeah you yeah. do you're like oh my god my ah. so we broke up for like a week maybe two i dated one woman very intensely for like a week i went on you know three dates in three days with three different people of all genders and then we got back together you know because everything moves faster when you're a teenager. Like a, yeah. a three-week relationship feels like forever. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, Agreed. <laughs> yeah. So, but no, I mean, so we had that little moment and we got back together and he, he was with someone else too during that time. So there was kind of a coming back together after we'd been with other people and we mm-hmm. knew all about it. We talked about it. Um, but we hadn't really had experiences with anyone else. But, you know, but again, I talked to him. I'm like, hey, I met this, there's this cute guy at my work and he's fun. And I think he's got a cute wife, I think. Like maybe we could go on a double date. And, you know, so we go on this double date and, you know, I'm out, me and the British guy are like out on the dance floor, just cutting a rug. And um, my husband and his wife are like both quiet. She's like a, a, like a graphic designer. And they're just like sitting and chatting and having their drinks. I'm like, this is all very perfect. So I orchestrate a nice little foursome and he and I communicated. I assumed that British guy would communicate with his wife. He did not. We had an evening. It didn't, I thought it went well. Apparently it did not go well for her. And she flipped out the next day. And I felt so bad. But it kind of blew everything up. And me and the British guy, I mean, we were falling in love. And so, and we were still working together. And so we're still talking. We're trying not to be together, but we, it, there's like this magnetic attraction happening. You know, I, I'm trying to keep my husband abreast of this. But one day I just, I, we went out to dinner, me and my husband. I'm like, look, I don't know what is happening to me. Like, I am falling in love with this person. I, and, Back then, it was still very much the serial monogamy thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That if you fall in love with someone else, that must mean the person you're with, you don't love them anymore. Yeah. 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 And that was definitely where my brain was. And and so I'm talking to my husband and I'm like, you know, I don't know what to do. Maybe we shouldn't have got married. I, I I'm falling in love with this person. What does this mean? And, you know, that night he slept on the couch and the next day he moved out. And that was the end of the discussion. Wow. Whoa. Yeah. Like, I I was thinking this would be the beginning of a discussion. You know, like, I don't know what I'm feeling. I don't know how to navigate this. I'm hoping we can figure it out together. And it was just, I think, too much for him or what I, I could write a whole book about what happened. I don't know what happened. We never talked about it. He wouldn't talk to me about it. All right. And you're what, 23, 24, maybe at this point? Yeah, I was probably 24 at that point. Yeah. 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 Wow. And so that was my, so that like blew up my relationship. And so I'm like, okay, I need to understand what's going on. So I'm looking, looking online. I don't know how I found some polyamory group. And I signed up on Meetup, Sandy P signed up on Meetup with my full name, Two weeks later or something, I get a message from my husband, who's a computer guy and has clearly been Googling me. He's like, so I see you joined a polyamory meetup with your real name. That's real stupid. So he totally, again, shamed me Yeah. for wanting to be out as polyamorous. And so again, I put it on lock, shut that right down, you know, and then I just dated for a while. And that was, those are like in the early days of the internet too. So yeah. like there wasn't that much out there. Right. Like I contacted Google. I'm like, you got to get my name off of here. <laughs> They're like, don't worry. It'll be gone in 30 days. But I like really reached out to Google. Like what the hell is going on? They're like, and they got back to me. <laughs> Google would not do that nowadays. <laughs> they were still in a garage down the street from you. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. The, yeah. This was, this was the year 2000. Yeah. 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 Wow. Yeah. So, so at that point, you've, I mean, it sounds like there wasn't even a discussion. You just, you, you shared it. He was sort of on board. It sounds like for the experiences until you're sort of like, Hey, I, you know, it sounds like you both had that mindset. Like if I fall in love here, all my other love gets erased. It just gets transferred like the title to a car. 
and we're just done. And he just, it's almost like he just accepted it and moved out. And that was the end of it. Right. Right. And I think this, this is what to me really illustrates how deep Mm -hmm. the, like the monogamous, like conditioning is Mm -hmm. that we didn't even have a concept of, oh, you can love more than one person at a time and be in relationship with more than one person. It doesn't take away love from you. And for me, that was like the huge paradigm shift. It was like, wait a second. I can love and be in relationship with more than one person. It's possible. Yeah. You know, it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to ask, what happened with you and the British guy? Uh, he enlisted in the U S special forces. He divorced his wife, enlisted in the army. I mean, we're still loosely in contact. Yeah. Honestly, more than you and I have had more contact than me and my ex-husband. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Over the years. Yeah. But yeah, it blew up his marriage too. Yeah. Yeah. And a reminder too, you're all are like in your early twenties, like there's, there's, yeah. there's a context there too. Yes. Like, like not, 24. Not, yeah. Not knowing, like just not having a lot, as much life experience. Right. So not, no life experience, zero. I don't know. I had not read the ethical slut at that point, you know, yeah. or any mm-hmm. books. There were not many books. There was just, I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know the concepts. Yeah. And so once that happened to me, cause I was determined not to get divorced. Like who, no one gets married thinking they're going to get divorced. Right. So all of a sudden I'm divorced at 24 and I'm like, okay, I need to figure this out. Like if half of people are getting divorced, if they're trying to be monogamously married, maybe something's wrong with marriage. Maybe it just doesn't work for people. There's got to be other ways to do it. So I just started researching. I don't know if I Googled things back then, but I talked to people, read books. I must have Googled something because I found a meetup group. You ask Jeeves did. Yeah. What we did back right. then. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. 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 And so this is when I really started exploring, okay, who am I? What's going on? And also it's just that stage of life where all of a sudden I have the freedom. I'm in a totally different state. I've given up my religion. I'm still still a spiritual person and I have I'm more of a mystic. So I had kind of started on a spiritual path in high school with like a, a, a spiritual mentor. And I've had that side of my life this whole time. It's like understanding myself personal growth and development has been like the foundation of my life. And lucky for me, I moved to San Francisco where all the other weirdos from everywhere come. And I found my other spiritual people who are like, I want to really learn about myself and let's do this together and let's help each other with this. And, and so the, those friends have really been like the foundation of my community. Yeah. And what I realized, you know, it, it, like if I reflect back on everything and look at where I am now, right now, I'm single. I practice solo polyamory. I kind of joke, I'm like a queen bee and I just have little honeybees who come and like sip from the nectar and then they fly away and everyone's happy because my, my commitment is to, I, I actually went back to Paris in 2019. I went to the Cartier flagship store and bought myself a Trinity ring. And I walked up to Sacre Coeur at night and I had a wedding ceremony for myself. And I married myself and God and the world. That's my commitment. Yeah. Like I want to be of service to people. And to me, having a, a partner or raising some children is not what I need, like, to feel satisfied, mm-hmm. you know? So I've just been kind of reflecting. I'm like, oh, I've kind of chosen a wild path for my life. Mm-hmm. You know, it hasn't been kind of centered around romantic relationship or a nesting partner even. I really love living alone. And I've learned that through the years too. Um, it just works better for me. I have a question about that. Because yeah. you said you've lived a wild life. And I'm curious, does it feel wild to you or does it, feel like everyone else is telling you it's wild? You know, that's probably more it. Because in my family, like I started out as the golden child, right? Like Mm -hmm. I'm the straight A student and president of the student council and captain of the volleyball and the basketball and 
the truck team, right? Like I can do no wrong. And then all of a sudden I'm getting divorced. I'm dating a bunch of people. What? She's bisexual, pansexual. What? She's doing what? I, the, the other piece was I got engaged a second time when I was 27, 28, living together, engagement ring on the finger. We're going to do it. He's ready. He's like ready for the house and the kids and everything. And I'm like, I think I want to go back to grad school because I went back to grad school to be a psychologist when I was 30. I was working in like construction management, doing business development at the time. And so I, again, it's one of these, these pivotal moments of like, I need to be honest with myself about who I really am. I do not want to be a mother and raise children. I do not want to buy a house. I want to go to grad school. And I don't think it's possible with this particular partner. I did an experiment one day. I sat in a chair just and we just read a book. And I could he he and the dog were like trying to get my attention. All of a sudden there's a glass of wine here and I can feel kind of the pouting energy of like why aren't you paying attention to me? I'm like, "Oh shit, this is never going to work." for me to go to grad school. You know, this is someone who really, he wanted a family, he wanted that situation. And so to me, the kindest thing I could do was I, I, I broke off the engagement. I took the ring off. I gave it back. I said, you know, cause I said, look, I'm polyamorous. This is who I am. We're engaged to be married. I don't think you want that. And he's like, well, I'll do it if you want it. And he's just so sad about it. I'm like, no, like I am not going to coerce you into doing this. I am not going to try and convince you to do this, but I can no longer lie to myself or let other people decide my course. So people were really pissed at me when I did this. I lost friends over this. Yeah. You know, it was, yeah, it makes that, I mean, somewhat it makes it sad and it makes sense. Yeah. You're uprooting something that had a trajectory. Right. Right. But you know what? Now he's married and has three little boys. And like when I look on Facebook every five or 10 years, he looks great, looks happy. I'm like, good. You got the life you wanted. I could not have given you that. Yeah. Which is such a an, a powerful thing to do. And again, I'm sure you, you lost friends and that's devastating you and probably devastated him. And I'm sure your heart was broken too, right? Like Absolutely. you don't get engaged thinking, no. eh, I don't really want to do like it wasn't no. on a whim, I'm sure. And, but to really think about like, would this have been good for either of us? Right. And it sounds like you landed, it wouldn't have been. Exactly. I could kind of see even five years into the future. And I'm like, we are going to be so unhappy. And if kids get involved, it's just going to, it's not going to be good. Yeah. You know, but it was really a reckoning with myself. And that's the moment where I just really owned I am polyamorous. That is it. I am not going to try and pretend anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Done. When you were dating until you met your fiance at that point, were you sort of exploring the non-monogamous side or were you sort of back into the serial monogamy because you'd been shamed right out of it? Yep. I was just kind of, yeah, just kind of meeting people out in the world before there was Tinder. You had to just meet people out in the world. <laughs> yeah. You just walk down hate and, uh, and there they were. You just, yeah, you just yeah. put in an application and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I dated a few people and you know, there were a few guys who were like, Hey, I want to be exclusive boyfriend, girlfriend. I'm like, I am not ready for that. I am just like getting out of a marriage. Like I need to yeah. figure myself out. And so I, I had, I broke some hearts along the way, you know, but again, we're still friends to this day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did you have the conversation with your fiance about non-monogamy? Like it sounds like you told him at some point during the breakup portion, but yeah. had it ever come up before that? Or was that sort of like your realization? It sounds like where it really yeah. solidified for you. I don't, I don't remember exactly. Yeah. I just remember at some point it really came out and I really owned it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so where did that take you? That took me to graduate school and two and a half years of celibacy. (laughs) 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 It's just like, like I couldn't even masturbate to orgasm. It was like nothing. And it was like, I had this interesting conversation with God. I'm like, God, 
I really like sex. He's like, no sex. I'm like, but come on, like, it's fun. It's good for you. (laughs) No. I'm like, okay, I'm going to be celibate. Okay. So I'm in grad school. I'm like deep in my learning of school. I'm deep in my spiritual path. I'm figuring myself out. I'm learning about psychology. And then I'm like, okay, it's time to date. And what do I do? I find out about this very cool website that is for open relationships. Ashley Madison. (laughs) Yeah. It is not for people wanting open relationships, I realized once I got on there. But I met someone who was married and um, was in a sexless marriage. I'm like, okay. So it's kind of like, ooh, the ethics of that are a little fuzzy. A little gray. Mm -hmm. A little gray. Um, But we went for it. And all of a sudden my creativity sparked again. He was a creative person who hadn't been creating, you know, and creativity and sexuality are so intertwined. Yes. And all of a sudden I'm writing songs and painting paintings. I'd never painted a painting. He was a painter. Like he's painting, he's making music. We're having this wild love affair. We only like probably linked up for sex like three times. But it was a very fruitful and productive, like, um, time. And then I discovered salsa dancing. I went to Costa Rica and discovered reggaeton and salsa dancing. And I'm like, this is cool. And so I started dating a Colombian guy here and we'd go salsa dancing. That was our thing. I just like study all week and then salsa dance for six hours on Saturdays. And so I told the guy, you know, I am the creative guy. I'm like, so I'm seeing someone else. He's like, we got to break up. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, well, you're having sex with someone else, so we got to break up. I'm like, dude, you are married. Like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. But it was so interesting that it was still because he wasn't having sex with his wife, but I'm having sex with another person. He needed to end it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, my mind is like, what are the parameters? What are, right? Yeah. Which is, you know, it's, it's the crazy piece, right? Is like, Ethics aside on being somebody's, we'll say, mistress, I suppose, right? You were trying to go about this in the ethical way around, you know, this other person knows, I'm going to tell everybody what's going on. And it's just, it's, it's always amazes me that then the people who are doing it, you know, secretly are like, whoa, hey, whoa, that's not okay. And you're like, right, what the fuck? Like, right, <laughs> right. So it's okay to lie, but it's not okay to be ab- above board about it. Right. That was what kind of got my brain twisty about it. Yeah. 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 So, and you had already been shamed for years. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so, so you get this spark though, and you lean into this and you start um, dating more. You learn salsa. Yeah. And you at some point finish grad school. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) And then I needed to, oh, during this time too, like I'm dating multiple people besides Colombian salsa guy. Well, did you end it with the, the Ashley Madison guy? He ended yeah. it. Oh, he ended, he ended it. it. He, so that was another one where he was, it wasn't even like a discussion. It was just like, Oh, well we're done. Yeah. Jesus. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Sandy. Just, just done. Yeah. 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 Oh well, yeah. Like a bandaid, I, I suppose in some ways, maybe uh, I don't know. Bandaid. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So you now you're multiply multiply dating. I'm dating. Yeah. Even like my good friend and roommate, um, she was dating someone, and he and I were kind of like looking at each other. She's like, "You can, you can go out with him," you know. But it, she was kind of new to it too, and so we kind of had a date. And then I'm like, "I'm just that's a little too messy. I'm just I'm not going to do that." Yeah. So, but it was good because she and I could kind of figure that out together. Mm -hmm. Um, But where things really kicked off for me polyamory wise is, you know, in graduate school for your doctorate, you have to do an internship and you just get placed. You apply at a few places. They put it in a black box. They pick a place. You're like, and you're going to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Woo. (laughs) So I ended up moving to the central coast didn't know a soul. And I was working on my dissertation research, which was uh, 
I have my little book right here. I got the book. Why not? Um, <laughs> toward a model of polyamorous identity development. So I put out a call for people who identified as polyamorous because I really, my question was like, how can someone go from not even knowing what polyamory is, it's not in their awareness, to then claiming as an identity, I am this, not just I do this, I am polyamorous. So I interviewed a bunch of people in slow. Um two of whom, many of whom became very good friends of mine, two of whom were my 98% matches on, uh, what's that? Come on, name a few of me. Okay, Cupid. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, on OK Cupid. Back when OK Cupid was first starting, 98% matches, and guess what? They were already dating. So I'm like, okay, that feels a little too messy also, so let's just be good friends with them. But it it was really the poly people and the kinky people who welcomed me in. They just brought me into this community and loved me. And back at the time, they had like a informal kind of like listserv for poly people. And um, so I was like, I was real into it. We're like, we're going to do meetups and we're going to like get together and... We're so I created a meetup group. I made a little logo. It's great, Central Coast Polyamory, and we're meeting at the Indian restaurant for the buffet on Tuesday night. And one night I go, and my boss and her husband and her son are at that table, and my professor friends are over at that table, and my friends from the kinky side of things are at that table, and I'm here at this table with the poly people. I'm like, this is way too many of my identities all in one room. I need to get us a private space. So I went to the LGBT center in slow and I got down on my knees and I said, please, the poly people need a private place to meet. They're like, well, that's not LGBT. I'm like, but most of us are <laughs> in some way or another queer, like help me out. And I got down on my knees and begged and they gave us a space. And so all of a sudden we have a space and we're doing a potluck and a uh, informational, like, uh, like a talk and like a, a process group. So I was into it like three times a month we're meeting and we, you know, grew the membership from like 80 to like 250 or something like that. I'm like, this is great. And then I was done with my internship and had to move. <laughs> <laughs> all that work. I mean, you learned a lot and made a lot of amazing friends and connections. Yes. And then you had to move. Yes. Yes. So I moved to LA. I did not have a job. This was very stupid. I don't recommend anyone move to LA without a job. But I thought LA is big. I will find a psych assistantship. I need or an internship, you know, a postdoc. I needed a postdoc. I didn't get one at Cal Poly that year or that semester. So I moved to LA without a plan. Oh, oh God. <laughs> and, and okay, I'm like, I'm going to get this information out to people. I have just done my dissertation. I have all this great information. I'm going to give talks about polyamory. And I spoke to the bisexual organization about polyamory. And a bunch of people showed up. And after the talk, I'm like, hey, is anyone going to lunch? They're like, we're going to lunch. I'm like, you want to all go to lunch together? They're like, yeah. And then boom, I had friends. Amazing. And I started dating someone who was dating someone else. And so he, genderqueer guy, uh, sh you know, he was dating a woman. She and I became really good friends. He broke up with me. She broke up with him. She and I are still friends. She is now they. So it's been like an amazing, like, journey of friendship with this person um, who's just like a dear friend, like saved my ass so many times in LA. Like at one point a man broke into my house at midnight and thank God I was not hurt. And I screamed real loud and used the weirding way. And he left without hurting me. But I was so like scared that I went and slept at my friend's house. And she just snuggled up to me and her partner, who is, they did a monopoly situation. He was monogamous. She was poly. As much as I tried to get him to do a threesome with us, he just wouldn't do it. It became like a little joke. But he like slept on the couch and let me sleep in their bed. And so she could hold me and I could feel safe. 
And it was like such an act of generosity and just that beautiful, like love and community. Like Mm -hmm. I'm I'm getting teary thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you hadn't experienced that as much before. This is some of your, like in, uh, SLO and like in slow and then in LA, like these are some of your first experiences of that. Right. And, you know, again, like if I had a breakup with someone before, like when I broke up with my fiance, some of people who are my friends were angry at me and ditched me as a friend. He was the best thing that happened to you. How could you do this to him? You know, and meanwhile, like someone is literally leaving his bed so I can, he's not even poly. He's dating someone who's poly, right? So that I can feel safe and welcomed. Like, wow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 I'm so grateful that you started to have those experiences. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Yeah. And, and really like, that's it. Like I've, as I've gotten to know, like different poly communities, you know, I got involved in the poly community in LA more, giving talks, just going to socials, running process groups, like the open heartedness, the generosity, the just like you belong here energy is just different from than anywhere I've felt. Well, maybe the kinky people are kind of like that too, but I'm not super kinky. You know, I'm kinky in like the grand scheme of things kinky, but in the world of kink, I'm pretty vanilla. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Right. It's, but still, it's just like, welcome. Welcome, weirdos. We love you. Yeah. You know? Well, also, too, Sandy, I want to just maybe point out it wasn't necessarily welcome. We love you. You were creating so many of these communities. You were yes. y- you were the one gathering everybody. And, and yes, they embrace you. But it wasn't like you walked into L.A. and found a 300 person poly hangout and you asked him if you could join. You You literally built it. Yeah. from the ground up, which I think is amazing. Yeah. Which is one of the reasons I moved to LA rather than back to the Bay Area is, you know, the Bay Area has a very established, you know, at the time, you know, poly community. You mm-hmm. guys have done a lot. I mean, you guys have done a lot since you moved here. Like, wow. You know, <laughs> but I like LA, it's a bit more conservative. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a bit more spread out. It's hard to find people. I keep, whenever I would write Los Angeles, I would write Lost Angeles. It's like, there's all these lost angels and there's a lot of really cool people there. It's just, it's so spread out. It's hard to be connected and everyone's yeah. there to like, make their career happen. So it's a, it's a weird city. I love it. Um, but I did go there specifically to help support polyamorous people, help support poly community. Um, and it was a very rewarding to be there for that reason. Did you eventually find a job? I created a job. Awesome. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I got there. I did a lot of network. When you do not, when you're not employed, you can do a lot of networking. I met all my people everyone professionally, personally, when I was unemployed, Mm -hmm. I moved back to slow. I got my job, a job back at Cal Poly. When I was done there, I decided not to stay in university counseling. I went to LA to look for a job. I I got, I I applied for a job at a university counseling center, didn't get it. I'm like, well, I guess I'm going into private practice. So that's what I did. Again, I wouldn't recommend doing it that way, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but I did and it worked out. Here I am. I have a private practice now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, and then you've been moved. So you've moved back and forth multiple times and then moved back up here to the yeah. Bay Area. Yeah. yeah. I moved back up here during the pandemic because, you know, poly people are very science based and they under, they talk about safer sex and man, they sure knew about how to keep COVID at bay. So we're all doing our COVID calculations. We're getting in our COVID bubble, you know, our pandemic quarantine bubbles. And because I was not in anyone's polycule like that deeply, I was kind of a little lone molecule floating in the universe by myself. I'm like, okay, I'm moving back up to the Bay Area where I've got all my rad single professional girlfriends who just have like one big, you know, poly bubble. And I'm just going to right into this bubble. Yeah. So I I think it's it's an amazing story up until this point. And I I have other questions, but one thing I did want to point out, and I I think it's rarely do we give advice on the show, but there's just some threads that you've dropped in here. And you kept saying, like, I don't recommend doing it this way. I don't recommend doing it this way. 
But I also think with all of the things that you did in there, there's so many people out there going, I can't find my people. I don't know where the people are. And, you know, back when you were doing this, you were kind of having to round them all up and create the spaces. I think a lot, but not all, but a lot of these spaces are starting to exist. You know, sure, in some corners of our country and probably many corners of our country, they don't exist. And to that, I I say, like, if you can safely do it right, one of the best ways to meet people is to be the organizer. And if the community already exists, reach out to them. Hey, I would like to get involved. How do I volunteer? I want to come. I want to be a part of this. Is there help? Is there a way I can help? And I think I just, I will say for myself, showing up to, let's say a munch or a meet and greet and being the person who's just like hoping somebody talks to you versus reaching out to the organizers and saying, Hey, I'm new. I'm nervous. Is there any way I can be of help? And maybe it's just like, can you go around and hand people a name tag? What better way to break the ice than, Hey, I'm Finn. Would you like a name tag? Right? Like, so get involved. A hundred percent. If the, if, if it exists and if it doesn't, try to make it exist. Yeah. Like you just, you've proved it here multiple times. I found my people here. I found my people here. I found my, you just built it. Yeah. yeah. No one would hire me. I created my own job. Yeah. And you know, and I guess that is one thing that I like about myself is like, once I figure out who I am and what I want, I just go for it. Like I, I go for broke literally and, and build. And I know a lot of people look at me and they're like, how do you have the courage to just move to a new town where you don't know anyone? I'm like, I don't know. My heart just called me there. That's where I got to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. It's amazing. And again, I know it's not for everybody. I know not everybody can do that. I, I think the thing that most people can do, though, is reach out to an organizer and ask how can I get involved? How can 100%. I help? Yeah. Well, and and the beautiful thing when I left Slow, I didn't just leave. I found people like, oh, those two like to cook. Let's put them and see if they want to do the potluck. Oh, this yep. person loves to read all the books. Hey, do you want to do the the educational piece of this? Mm-hmm. You know. So yeah, yeah. So that 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 those groups could continue. Right. And then it, it wasn't all on my shoulders. Like, I don't, yeah. I don't need to be the one doing everything. It's too much. Yeah. I want other people to, to, to make it their own, to, you know, it's our community. It's not mine. It's ours. Yeah. 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 So, so throughout all of this, there's all of these community organization, volunteering, working. How was, how was Sandy's like actual polyamorous life right. going? Right. How is that going for you? Yeah, you know, LA is a very international city. Mm-hmm. And what I realized when I was in grad school is there was a model I found in the, in the course of my research where it's like, here's the components of a relationship. There's romance, there's love and emotional intimacy, there's sex. I'm like, you know, I'm getting my emotional intimacy from my friend group. I'm getting my intellectual needs met with my re- with my work, my research, my studies. I'm getting my romance met with my gay boyfriends, you know, or whoever, my cuddly whatever friends. I just want some sex. So I had lovers. I had lovers from all around the world. I put my little thing on Tinder and I just went, let's do whatever age. <laughs> Men in their 20s love me. Okay. I'm like, okay, I guess we're just leaning into that. Who knew? Who knew? But interestingly, I had a wild experience of dating and having sex with men literally all over from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sometimes ongoing, sometimes just a one-time thing. I dated a few women here and there too. But if you're bisexual and tender and you put both, you only really get men. You get like one woman for every like 10,000 men. Um, so I met women dif- in different ways. But so it was a wild experience of like, okay, I'm like, I, I have traveled the whole world in my living room, you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Which, yeah. What an incredible experience to have to be able to meet, I mean, the the worldview you get, right? I, I People say all the time, right? If you travel, like one of the most powerful ways to get rid of ignorance in a lot of ways is to travel the world and see other cultures. And you were 
think the world came to you yeah. in the form of 20 year old dudes who wanted right. some Sandy. <laughs> right. And I got to talk to them about polyamory, about open relationships, you know? Um, but I do have to share one story because, um, I went to Colombia with a friend and, you know, I'm on Tinder and I literally met a soulmate in Colombia, like, and then we stayed in contact, like contact three years later, I was going to go to Taiwan with some friends. They were going to be there for three weeks. I was joining them week two. One of them had an accident and fell down and hurt themselves. So they decided to scrap the trip. So I'm like, I didn't want to go to Taiwan except to be with my friends. Universe, where should I go? It's like Buenos Aires. I'm like, okay. Going to Buenos Aires, changed my ticket, changed my money, went to Buenos Aires and found out the Colombian guy actually lived in Buenos Aires. I did not know this. So we did not meet up that trip, but I came back later that year and I lived there for a month and we had a wonderful like one month romance. We had deep conversations about polyamory and open relationships. He's like, oh my God, you're blowing my mind. Um, And then the pandemic hit. And I didn't go back. He found a girlfriend. We're still deep soul friends, but he's monogamous with her. Mm -hmm. But even now he'll like send me little like memes or stuff about polyamory in Spanish, which I'm not a hundred percent fluent, but I I get the gist. (laughs) So it's, it's just like wildly fun that because I have the life I've chosen, I can connect with people very freely. Like I really wanted this, this combination of freedom and connection. I wanted both in my life and I've somehow managed to create that. You know, if I find a connection with someone, I have the freedom to explore it wherever it's going to go, whether it's one night or a lifetime. And to me, that's, that's been just a very deep value that I have that I didn't get to have. And then I have fought very hard to have. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's inspirational. I think it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious throughout that, one of the things you you tossed out earlier was you are very jealous and that you've done a bunch of work on that. <laughs> and I'm curious. As a, that was a teenager. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious how this this thread of yeah. possessiveness and jealousy and like you like you said, you've done work on it. I'm curious what it looks like and how you moved through that or yeah. with it. Yeah. Yeah. So part of it is, you know, at some point in my life, I had a paradigm shift from competition and competitiveness and jealousy to like love and abundance and cooperation. And man, that other, that other worldview is so insidiously installed in us. I'm fighting against it every day of like, no, We don't have to have wars. We can figure out a way to live together peacefully, even within ourselves, within our relationships. And so it's just like really a deep under like awareness of self and what is happening for me. So like, I'm, I don't know, let's say I'm with someone, I am with someone right now. We're lovers. He dates other people. You know, we're together. I see the little Tinder thing pop up on his phone. And like, okay, of course, like we both know we're dating other people, you know? So there's that in that moment, there's this flash of like jealousy, possessiveness, insecurity. And then I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, where are you at right now? You are with this person who you have an amazing connection with. We are going to enjoy this, right? We are not going to start a fight. We're not going to put yourself down. We're going to enjoy this connection that's happening right now. In fact, we're going to infuse it with more love and more juiciness. And that's a nicer way to go than to shut down, create a fight. Like, why would we do that? Right. So, so, but it is not pretending I'm not jealous or pretending Mm -hmm. I'm not possessive. Those things are live within me. They live within all of us, but we have a choice. And I am making a choice to not do that and to do this, to be loving, to, to, you know, a foster abundance, to foster connection. Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's not to say it's not hard or that right. you can't even talk about it. I mean, right. That's not to oh. say you can't be like, Hey partner, right. it'd be great if when we're hanging out, you, you 
it would be helpful if you could pause your notifications. Right? 100%. He can be like, no, screw you. Yeah. I want to get all the notifications. Yeah. But at least you can talk about it. Right. And he, to his credit, he didn't look at it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, I don't even think he was in the room at that moment, you know. So, yes. And that's the other thing is, oh, wait, I can ask for what I want. That's so nice. We can negotiate that. That's great. <laughs> Yeah, we well, can talk about it. Well, that's not the experience you had, right? Because your experience is if I said, hey, that's really hard when you get a right. notification, you'd be like, well, I guess we're done here. And he'd be out the door before you even like finished your sentence. Right, right, right. So it's definitely been like a relearning for me of like yeah. how, okay, I have figured out what I want, <laughs> step one, <laughs> which is a very difficult step and an ongoing step. Step two, uh, can I ask for what I would like and what I need in a very sweet and nice way. And then can we negotiate it? And I don't have to pout if I don't get things exactly my way. Yeah. 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 It's, I love how you reframe that. Cause like, and the first step, figuring out what you want, we all have to do that Yeah, and it can change over time. And that in and of itself is so like that's that that piece is all of the pieces are difficult and that the starting point is difficult. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you're right, it does change over time because it's like, okay, now I'm 48. I'm not 24 anymore. I'm 48. Dating a 24 year old, but 48. Okay, that's fine. And I'm like, okay, I'm here in Petaluma. I'm I'm settled. It doesn't look like I'm gonna be moving anytime soon. Do I want a partner person? who's maybe more involved in my life? Maybe I do. Maybe that could be, I'm considering a king size bed for the next bed upgrade. Well, maybe I would like to sleep with someone again. I haven't done that. I really like to sleep alone. I sleep a lot better alone. I'm like, you know, I'm like, this is a big deal for me, considering Mm -hmm. sleeping with someone in the bed, not just having sex in the bed, right? So, but it's interesting to be like, okay, here I am. Do I want this? Do I not want this? I don't know that I do, but I'm considering it. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting with it. And and yeah. Yeah. So I guess it's one of those things too, where it's like, I'm just going to be open to what life brings me on some level. Like I'm not striving for it. Yeah. I'm very happy with my life. I'm like, you know, I'm living my purpose. There's always more to grow into. Like I'm kind of in a stage where it's like, okay, what's next? Um. So, you know, we'll see. I'm open. Yeah. Open to possibilities. Yeah. <laughs> I, just, I just laughed because <laughs> you said, like, I'm kind of in that stage. And I'm like, I think Sandy at this point is not a stage. It <laughs> might just be Sandy who's like, all right, what's next? Like, uh, let's right. like, live the hell out of life. And right. I love that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But it's interesting that even now there's this part of me that gets pulled to, yeah, but maybe you should have a partner. Like, shouldn't you have a partner at some point? Mm-hmm. It's so fascinating to me. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've demonstrated to myself over these many years that, hey, I actually like it like this. <laughs> yeah. 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 I but think- it's, I think it is important to question that once in a while though. Like even sure. though you've demonstrated that for yourself, for your yes. life, mm-hmm. questioning it and considering it is one thing, but right. then like, because we all grow and change, you could right. shift, but like you could still fight, like be, be who you are and decide right. to, to like to have a partner. Like a more right. serious ongoing partner. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, and the message we get so much is that that's what we should do. I mean, you've been yes. getting it your whole life. We, right. We've been getting it our Which whole lives. Sense. And and I'm, I do love that you kind of stop and think about it and you question it because yeah. I'm curious, do you get that pushback from people still? Like, well, when are you going to pick one? When are you going to settle down? When, like, and does it start to eat at you? Like, Am I really happy? Maybe I'm not happy. Maybe I just am pretending to be happy because like you seem like you're loving this. Like you've kind of got your three pillars. You're getting your needs met. Like you don't seem to be in a state of like wanting or hurting. It's like, it seems to be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I attribute that one to like having such a robust friend group Mm -hmm. that if I don't want to be alone, I don't have to be alone. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So if I, if I'm alone, I'm choosing it. Okay. Um, am I having as much sex as I would like? Are any of us having as much sex as we'd like? You know, maybe. Um, but also just because you have a partner doesn't guarantee you're going to have sex. Nope. Right. But yeah, there is, it's funny, even sometimes 
you know, I'm a therapist. We don't usually talk about ourselves. So you guys are like, you're getting like the big exclusive. I've never really talked this openly to anyone outside my close people about the journey. I've asked very, plenty. We're plenty very grateful people. for that. Yes, oh yeah. Yes. I'm grateful. I'm grateful that you asked me and I'm grateful that I have the courage to finally do it. Um, but you know, I'm not, I am somewhat transparent about who I am with clients, particularly if they ask me because to me, I think that is important that mm-hmm. if, if it is close to someone's identity, they need, they want to know, are you going to get me? But I had a client say to me recently, oh, you can find a partner if you want one. It'll be so easy for you. But there is kind of this assumption that I wanted one. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm like, but what if I don't want one? Yeah. 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 But, but it, it put that little seed of doubt in my mind. I'm like, should I want one? Yeah. Would I actually find a partner? I don't have a partner. So maybe I couldn't, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, whoa, stop. Like, <laughs> don't go there. That's just ridiculous. This is what I've done for years and years and years and years. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. But it is, it's still, the, especially as a woman, like, it's like, so there's so many negative stereotypes about people who are not partnered as they get older, but women, especially Mm -hmm. it's like, what's wrong with you? Something, you know, I'm like, nothing's wrong. And part of that is like one of my deep missions on earth is to be of service. You know, like I want to help other people figure out who they are in very deep and authentic ways, particularly in terms of sexuality or gender or, you know, how we do relationships. Um, and there's a lot of unlearning that we need to do. Um, and so many people don't even understand that, that this insidious like programming of who you're supposed to be has happened, mm-hmm. you know, and I do understand that. And I'm working very hard to peel away those layers and to understand what they are and to like, let me emerge. Um, and it evolves and changes over time. So, Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't want to shut myself down from opportunity or possibility. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I love what you said there. They're like the, the letting yourself emerge. Right. But as you said, it changes over time. And it's like, so you're constantly having to reemerge. Like, here's me today. Here's me today. Here's me today. And people are constantly having to adjust to that, accept it, love you for who you are today, not who they think you should be, not who you were 20 years ago, but who you are today. Right. And I, I do think one of the challenges I had with when I was partnered with someone is I'm on a very fast personal growth trajectory. Like I'm on like the speed train Mm -hmm. and most people don't sign up for that train. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, good. We got it figured out. We're good. And I'm like, two weeks later, I'm a different person. And they're like, uh, you coming? Are you coming along here? Mm -hmm. And they're like, what is happening? Who are you? I don't even know who you are anymore. And so, so I think partly that's why I don't have a partner is I haven't found someone yet, or maybe I won't ever, who wants to really like change that quickly and who can be okay being like, whoa, we've, we're going different ways now. I love you. Let's, let's part peacefully, you know, or, oh, we're coming back together. Great. And this, to me, this is the beautiful thing about polyamory is there is that fluid, fluidity and flexibility. You know, I've had friends or lovers who are friends who are lovers again over the years. Like Mm -hmm. it's so amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think to that point, it's the idea if you're changing super fast and in reality, I think, yeah, some people do stall out, but we all still change and grow through that. But to be able to say, okay, today our relationship makes sense like this Mm -hmm. and it fits in this box. And then I did a whole bunch of changing. You did a bunch of changing. It doesn't fit in that box, but that doesn't mean we have to be like, well, I guess we're, I guess we'll just walk out the door and never talk again. We just can say, we take a, maybe this piece doesn't fit, but these other ones fit and this new one comes in and it's way better, Yeah, but it just looks different. Right. And I think this is where one, people who are monogamous can learn from polyamorous people. Like we're kind of constantly renegotiating our relationships. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even, even if it's with the same partner. Mm -hmm. And I think at least my experience of monogamy was like, 
if we change that much, all of a sudden we don't fit together anymore. So inevitably we need to break up. I know some monogamous people just that commitment is important and they mm-hmm. just stick through it, yep. but they're unhappy <laughs> because they don't, they're not, there's not that freedom to like explore other parts of themselves because it's just this one person. Um, so yeah, I wish that, that idea of flexibility, renegotiation, like interacting with other people to meet different sides of yourself, mm-hmm. you know, and that, I mean, that's one of the joys for me of being polyamorous is like, I get to meet a new part of myself every time I interact with someone new. You know, yeah. the thing I love about my work is every person is a universe unto themselves, mm-hmm. you know, to mm-hmm. explore and like wonder at. And Well, and you, you also had that paradigm shift that now you're, I'm again, not perfectly probably, but able to, lean into the compersion around that, the happiness when you see somebody else changing yeah. and somebody else growing rather than being like, no, don't change because I want to keep it in this box. You're like, go, you, be, you, change, grow into whatever you are and we will figure out what what we are at that point. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Easy work to do though. Right? I'm just thinking that's really easy to do. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you so much, Sandy, for for trusting us and for just showing up and sharing everything that you did today. It was it's just been so lovely to talk with you and hear your journey. Um, also, the most exciting part is in two weeks we can do it again because she'll change, and then we can, <laughs> we'll just have a whole new story in two weeks. It'll be it'll be amazing. <laughs> Maybe three. We'll give it three. <laughs> okay, give me three because you know I've got to like update my social media to reflect yeah. the changes. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Going to change your relationship status to it's complicated. <laughs> oh God, I just took it off. I changed it to it's complicated once, and I got so many messages. I'm like, okay, relationship status does not belong on social media anymore. No. Done. No. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, it is complicated because yes. no. relationships are complicated. Exactly. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah um we'd love for you to share where people can find you um yeah yeah, yeah you can find me um at my website uh just is drsandypeace.com i'm on instagram at dr sandy peace twitter at dr sandy peace tiktok at dr Sa- you get the drift we get so, and the links will be in the show notes so nobody has to remember anything yes yeah awesome and what type, I mean, just to, to, if you're willing to expand a little bit on like the type of work you do, I know you said you're a therapist and the different types of populations you work with, but what can people expect when they, when they land yeah. with you? Sure. Um, partly it depends on what they're coming in with, mm-hmm. um, because you treat different things in different ways. But one of my main principles is we need to just sync up our thoughts, our emotions and our somatic experience, our sensations, like they're often so out of sync and man, our brains are real tricky. It can, they can really talk us into or out of anything. And we've really been trained to think from the neck up. We're not trained how to feel our emotions and understand them or feel our body and, and listen to the wisdom it has for us. And so a lot of the work I do is working to get everything synced up. Um, but it's also about awareness. It's also about um, just like acknowledging pain and, and and making space for pain to emerge and and be processed out and to be healed and resolved. But then also we're trying to change and move into something different, you know, some something that's happy or something that works for us better. And so I guess very much like the my my process of becoming polyamorous is we need to understand, okay, what are your deep needs, desires, drives, like goals, values, and how do we translate that into reality? Um, And so there's a lot of tools and tricks on how to do that, you know, and, you know, it's just so fascinating how different it can be working with an individual versus working with two people, three people in the room, group therapy, like, whoa, it's just, we're infinitely co- complex and the connections are just so like 
wild and wonderful. And yeah, I love it. I love it. <laughs> so that probably answers my question of like, do you primarily mm-hmm. primarily work with individuals or you work with a spectrum? Uh, I work with a spectrum. I think it's probably most of my practice is individuals, but um, I do sex therapy too. And while plenty of individuals come in for sex therapy, a lot of folks come in together as a couple for help, mm-hmm. just like figuring out what's happening for their intimacy and mm-hmm. helping things shift. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, we're really excited to get everything out there that you talked about today. And um, is there anything else you'd like to share before we let you go? Uh, What would I like to share? Hmm. I wrote a couple things down. (laughs) The last thing I wrote down on my little list. Okay, make sure you talk about these things. Um, I'll just read my little list. Here's are the things I wanted to share tonight. And I think we touched on most of them, but... We are talking about a major paradigm shift when we talk about moving into polyamory, but I really think it's a paradigm shift we need to make as a planet and as individuals, and that is moving from this either-or dichotomous thinking to Mm both-and, you know, and bringing in the sense of abundance rather than scarcity and the idea of cooperation versus competition. Like, unless we resolve these things, I really think we're going to destroy our planet Mm -hmm. and ourselves as a species. Um, So we, we got to figure this out. Um, And, and partly as a, I chose to be a psychologist rather than a politician or a political activist, because I, I do believe that we have to resolve that within ourselves for it to ripple out into the change in the world. Um, and so psychology is just such that individual work, but also is there a way to move into celebration of sexuality and love and connection rather than shame? I was shamed so much into, so I wouldn't be who I actually was. And I had to really work hard against those social forces and against my own internalized shame to like blossom into the kind of life and kind of relationships that I want that are still evolving, that are, you know, will still change. And then my last and favorite, because I am a rebel at heart is authenticity, not rules. You know, we, we inherited this culture from the people who came before us is broken. Hmm. It's broken. And so, you know, I really want to invite people to, search deep within themselves from a really heart-based, love-centered place and go, okay, who am I? Like, who am I? How do I want to express myself? How do I want to connect? How do I want to be of service to others? And not just do things because we're supposed to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you you didn't say that an hour ago because we just spent the whole (laughs) interview (laughs) about that. This, This is such... I think for me right now, I will say uh, as sort of this very big thing in my mind and the, the, the term that kind of landed in my lap was social reality. And that's um, kind of something I've been researching a bit about, but there is so much of what we do that we do just because, I mean, the, the easiest example is money, right? We have these pieces of paper worth actually nothing right. in terms of like their actual value as a resource and we have as a society socially decided that it is something and you can look at dozens and dozens of examples of things that we do just because we somewhere along the way said do it yeah it exists now it is yeah and and so you know not that we should tear down all of these but to look at some of them and say what am i what do i actually think what do i actually want to do who am i yeah i think is a really powerful thing to start doing and it's so hard because not many people are doing it Mm -mm. and you're gonna have to push against a lot of people and institutions and systems and Mm -hmm. it's hard as hell Mm -hmm. yeah Mm -hmm. yeah it is well thank you for leading the charge yes and thank yeah. you for all of those wonderful nuggets on your note, too, yes. at the end. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. <laughs> hey. 
Yeah. Thank you so much, both of you, for doing the work you're doing in the world, for bringing so much love, for clearly loving each other so much, and just for being, you know, a wonderful, welcoming, and warm um, host today. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we know this won't be our last time, Sandy, so we will let you go tonight, and we will schedule a conversation in three weeks, and we'll Sounds talk about it. <laughs> I'll give you the full report on all the changes. Perfect. We look forward to it. Have a wonderful (laughs) evening. Thank you. (laughs) And we are back. Thank you so much, Sandy, for coming on, sharing everything that you did, and for the amazing work you do, as always. As listeners know, we had such a fun, fun time talking to you. Thank you for all the laughter and vulnerability in this conversation. Yeah, we laughed, we went deep, we teared up a little bit. Just a beautiful story. So yeah, grateful to have amazing people like like Sandy on our show. Yes. And a quick reminder, links to all of Sandy's work can be found in your podcast show notes. That's in your podcast player or on the show notes on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the podcast tab. I think one of my takeaways from this episode was, you know, there's really not a right way to do non-monogamy. <laughs> Good good segue. Good segue. <laughs> we have a workshop tonight called Is There a Right Way to Do Non-Monogamy? It is a free virtual workshop. And when I say tonight, I am talking specifically July 17th, 2024. You can find out more information on our website, normalizingnonmonogamy.com. Click on the big banner at the top where you can get yourself a free ticket to the free workshop on the free app. Yes. Lots of free stuff happening tonight. Yes. Come come and join us. And a quick reminder, too, that we have a community retreat coming up. That's an in-person community retreat for our virtual community that is happening September 13th to the 15th, 2024. Find out more on the community tab of our website. And next week, we will be back at you again with another interview. Episode 350. Episode 350. Just cruising along. Yeah. And that will be with Flora and Andy. Yes. A beautiful, beautiful conversation. Cannot wait to bring this one to you. We will see you all tonight on Zoom. Yes. For the free virtual workshop. Is there a right way to do Amanagui? <laughs> and then we will see you next week. Yes. Can't wait. Bye. Right. What? What? Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>